I would like to introduce to you Henrik Tomea from Sweden, the second Sweden, uh, Swedish person who is here with us to support the efforts in fighting untouchability. I was so very delighted to meet with Henrik. We only, I got an email from him saying I'm from the Swedish Humanist Association and I'm coming to Hyderabad. And he came with his camera and he joined me and a few friends when we were going to visit some Dalit villages. And he very kindly and nicely turned it into a film, which we are very pleased to release at the conference. And it is called Superstition Kills. One thing that is very rarely noticed in all the work that is being done in the Dalit community is that people are ignoring the havoc that superstition is creating in the lives of the Dalit people and the fact that the Dalits are the first victim of superstition. When, and it really is true, there is the occasional human sacrifice that still happens near the high-tech city of Hyderabad, the victim is not an upper caste child, the victim is a Dalit child. And there are women who are killed, there are people whose teeth are plucked out, because as you all know, it is in the teeth of the magic man that his power resides. And it is best that you pluck these teeth out when the person is still alive and conscious and can feel the pain. This is something that happens even now. And Henrik came along with us when we visited a village where a woman was murdered. And murdered having been accused of being a witch. The extraordinary thing for us was when we met the people in the village, they all said they were sorry she was killed because she was not a witch, implying that if she were a witch, it would have been all right to kill her. Now that is just earlier this year, 2009, end of January. So it's, it's not very clear if we are really living in 2009 when we go and meet people who talk like that. Hendrik, I don't know if you want to say something apart from... Yes, well, to me this has been a couple of days of a learning experience to be here. I've, there's so many people that know so very much about untouchability and I'm really in this process of listening and learning and, and trying to, to understand the, the mechanics. And what I've understood is that it's of course an extremely complex uh, structure, untouchability, driven by many forces. But what is also clear is that we have this with power, with money, with uh, structures that people want to sustain. But superstition is the perfect super glue to keep it together. And as Leo said yesterday, how do you get rid of untouchability if you don't remove superstition? So to me, having sort of spent um, a year uh, learning a lot about humanism in Sweden by sort of filming, making interviews with uh, people that are working within this, uh, this subject in Sweden, it was a, fresh of, a breath of fresh air to see how the Indian rationalist and humanist associations worked extremely hands-on in the fields to actually make a change. And uh, there was many moments while I was filming that I actually had sort of tears in my eyes while I was sort of filming, and still when I watched the film, okay, I shouldn't exaggerate, you'll have to watch it yourself, <laughs> but, but I still, I get touched by this. And, and I think that humanism in Western Europe is a lot about does God exist or not, having a philosophical academic discussions, and this was something completely different. So to me, it was a privilege to have the opportunity to join these groups, to join Babu during these few days, and to be able to capture this. And hopefully, this little film can help bring about inspiration to other groups as to how they can work against superstition in their local region. So I let this, the film speak for itself, and uh, hopefully you'll find it interesting. But we have identified this as a case that we will pursue. And therefore, aided with this, using this most valuable tool, thank you, Henrik, we will release the film in two or three places. I just heard from Anand that he would like to release it in uh, Delhi. Like And 
and we'll keep you informed because one of several dozen murders, at least we will document. And the fact that the superintendent of police did not do much, Veeraswamy can confirm that when the dogs were going, the police dogs were going to a particular person's home, the inspector of police stopped the dogs and said, it's time for them to have their lunch. And this was all planned. There are people who have gone and given affidavits <coughs> about this, and we'll follow it up. But this intersection of caste violence, of superstition, using it as a justification, this poor woman had the courage to buy land in the upper caste colony and build her house. How could that be accepted? She was sitting on courts and not standing up when the upper caste people were passing by. You've seen what, what happened on the CNN film yesterday. And here was a woman defying them. And it was a woman. How dare she do it? All these things. Levy, you wanted to say something. I would uh, like to add to this presentation a problem that is caused not by the old culture of India or Africa, but uh, imposed uh, by and imported from the Western countries. I'm thinking of all those evangelists and healing preachers who are traveling around in exactly that kind of, of, of the world that already have this leaning to superstition and strengthen it so strongly by doing what they call miracles talking to those people that had been together with him in these big assemblies. They told they had healed hundreds of people and we spoke to the uh, responsible politicians around there and said, no healings, we didn't see anything of that, so I can't. This is not true. And we got to Norwegian television uh, to make a film about this because we, or Bob and, and his, uh, his team they went with us out to this uh, small place and they interviewed the, the local uh, mayor and we exposed this very famous Norwegian preacher back in Norway. So be aware that we are not innocent in this development of superstition in the third world today. We have a responsibility back home. And I'm quite sure Leo Igwe could add to my presentation of this what is going on in Africa, where the American, British, German, Scandinavian preachers come and have these big assemblies, gather thousands of people to come to the meetings and, and, and they strengthen their, uh, the, the way they are thinking of spirits and, 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 uh, and, and uh, witch, uh, witchcraft, yes. So, thank you. Because you're also doing a lot of work in Birmingham, aren't you? Yes. And trying to expose the charlatans. Yeah, it's what is taking place in, in England is nearly more than a 40 million pounds business the psychics, fortune tellers, they're doing nowadays. And it's spreading so fast, only three weeks ago, a relative of mine, he rang me, that, will you come to our house? I said, what's wrong? But somebody killed a badger and they left in front of their house. And it was, the, they call it black magic, they done with the red thing, or Lord Sindhu, and all the little things. And they've done it in England just two, three weeks ago. And it's happening very common now. It's taking place in Asian area. These things happening very common. It's really common. So, you know, it's not in India. It's coming over here very fast now. Right. But being brought by Indians. Well, brought by Indians. The main reason is because so many psychics and fortune tellers in in hands of the Birmingham, you can't believe it. On the radios, on the papers, full of them, and people going them, and they are seeking help, and they're making it. It's uh, government's work. They're making more over 40 million pounds business only in England. And in, in uh, the films, as you shown, uh, in Punjab, our sister organisation, they made quite a few actually films, documentary films about all this. Thanks. Yeah, a few things I want to add first of all to put one slide. I lived in Birmingham for 10 years so, and I was a community worker there for a long time. 
I think part of the problem is that the diaspora Indians in this country tend to come from villages. You know, 30, 40 years ago, they came to England. There is a certain section which have done pretty well for themselves. They got their, uh, either themselves educated or their children educated. Now, the older generation is still sort of in somewhat of a time warp. And with the recession that has hit us, especially, some of the problems that the older community faces are multifaceted. And sometimes they don't even know where to turn to when they have some quite what they perceive to be some very quite complex problems. So, therefore, I was actually shocked when I had, when I visited Birmingham in the last few months, I picked up the local Punjabi paper, and there's four pages of fake holy men, Baba, Swamis, what have you. And some of the, um, uh, some of the description is quite ridiculously outrageous. You know, you don't have to be a rationalist to disbelieve them. You have to be just an ordinary person to say, well, this is all plain rubbish. But apparently, they have a ready market. Now, I remember about 14 years ago, I presented a, a paper to the Punjab Research Group on a little, little known cult of Guga in Punjab, North India. And part of that was the references to Baba Balaknath, who was another sort of a semi mythological figure. To my horror, about eight years later, I found out that the worship of this Baba is very much alive and well in Wolverhampton. Whereas in my paper, I had described it as a dying, if not a dead cult. That was my information at that time. But obviously, things have changed in the meanwhile. So I just want to go back to the field, right? I think it was quite obvious that the lady who was killed it was a multiplicity of reasons. Obviously, she was challenging the system in various ways. And so somebody found a way of eliminating her by using superstition as a tool. And I think it just goes to prove that it doesn't matter where you turn to in the Indian society, the monster of caste sooner or later will rear its ugly head. Doesn't matter whether you approach it from this angle, from that angle, whether you study this, caste somewhere is going to turn up. And linking that to the sort of human sacrifice, I mean, you can, you can argue that you kill a woman because there is some money, there's some stake at stake, there is, she's challenging the system. I mean, even the murderers themselves didn't want to kill her because they had to get drunk. Obviously, they knew but what they were doing was quite wrong. So it wasn't, in a sense, easy for them to kill her because they had to actually turn themselves into something else before they could commit this heinous murder. But we have this concept of human sacrifice, which is still prevalent you know, in certain, certain parts of India. Now, what do people gain by sacrificing another human being? That's, a, that's a quite a logical question to ask. And I think the two are linked in the same way. The witch, the witch murders, and the human sacrifice, in so much that a one group of people, a dominant group, is reconfirming its power, even on a theological superstitious level. Now, I think it was something like that that must have made a Ambedkar to say. He said, lions and tigers are never sacrificed, only goats and sheep. <laughs> I think it's a very astute observation. <laughs> and, and, yeah, I, I mean, I laughed at it when I first read it, and then, you know, over the years I had pondered over this, and, and I, th I think I know what he's talking about. And just going back to Anand's, you know, earlier contribution about what is the sort of legacy of Ambedkarism, for me, on a personal plane, I mean, I, I do not believe in Buddhism. You know, I, I generally don't tend to. Uh, believe in any religion, I'm an atheist, but I do try to analyze religions. Why is it that the religion has such a hold on Indian people? It's a sort of reoccurring theme in, in my mind. And I think part of the reason is that there are two types of religions in India. There is a mainstream, what we might term Hinduism, which upholds the caste system, is hardwired into it. And then, then we have other currents, like you have Lokaitic, which is actually not a religion, this is a uh, 
a, a rationalist philosophy, an ancient Indian rationalist <coughs> philosophy, as you know. And then there's Buddhism, which is anti-caste. Then we have the Bhakti movement, which is anti-caste. We have religions like Sikhism, which is anti-caste. And then, of course, Ambedkar's own philosophy is entirely anti-caste. So there is this, if you like, a struggle of opposites throughout Indian history. And I think that's what made Ambedkar go back to Buddhism. I, although I believe that, I mean, I have arguments on the internet with other Dalits. I, you know, I've said it is wrong, you know, to believe in Buddhism because of this um, reincarnation theorem and so on. But I think the biggest thing, the biggest legacy that Ambedkar has left for our people, I think, is the critical thinking. I mean, he's such a multifaceted <coughs> genius, but his contribution toward challenging everything in India, anything that you can think of. I mean, I recently went back to his riddles in Hinduism. Here is a man who, right to the end of his life, is actually asking the questions, you know, why this contradiction in Hinduism? Why this ambiguity? Why this, you know, two, two opposite things in there? So much so that I actually started to write a reply to the riddles in Hinduism, because I, I felt, right, nobody's given answers to this. So I must do it, you know, for myself. And I think that is the biggest contribution, you know, Ambedkar had made to the Dalit course, is a critical thinking. I mean, he said, educate. That was his first, you know, the Atatva slogan. Educate, organize, and agitate. And I think the, 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 the best thing that uh, the humanists in this country can do, right, is to actually popularize educate others in this country, you know, about the Dalit issue. Sorry I've taken so much time. Thank you very I much. I just felt that's, I had to sort of... That's yeah, absolutely on the spot. That is what we are discussing. You want to discuss. As uh, we are gathered here in this country, we are talking about too much about India. But we should talk also about here, which is a totally been ignored. To save few, five minutes, ten minutes, somebody should be spoken. Yeah, and we should also learn from uh, the uh, women's society in the England. They published uh, one magazine, women's, and the other free thinker. I think we should read all those bo both papers. I was, I was in London and I was trying to see on the buses. Uh, which I read in the past, the buses had carrying advertisement, there is no God. And we should raise this slogan for the Indian people. Until the God is there, people will be pushed into the dark. And if we want to bring those people out of dark, we have to hit all, all religions, not one religion, all religion, not promote one religion or one person which could show us God. We should hit all, all religion and there is openly say there is no God and get away people, find it yourself, stand on your feet and all that's my message. Thank you. Thank you. I think like Woody Allen said, there's probably even no plumber on a sun Sunday. Yes, Leo. Well, I, there was something you said. Um, about sacrifice, you said why sacrifice? Uh, uh, tigers and lions are never sacrificed, yeah. only goats and sheep. For me, why sacrifice at all? Why? Because it, it allows you to reinforce your uh, uh, superiority, your hierarchical... Uh, well, I don't, I, don't understand, I don't understand that, I don't understand that. You see, okay. you, see, you see, for me, you see, we keep preparing over this thing. We keep preparing over it, and that is what is making me impatient and sometimes with our discussion. Why should we... And Insect, snake, rat, human being, why should we sacrifice at all? Of what value is it? That is the problem. The problem there is that, you know, no more we're trying to say, oh, well, we should not, we should, we should sacrifice this animal. For what? To who? <laughs> so, that, that's my problem. That's, that's, I'm, I'm still trying to understand why we should even discuss this. As it's something that is not, not to you. I'm not talking to you. I'm not talking to you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. I so, think Mina wanted to say something. I think Leo's getting very impassioned, yeah. um, and I think it's a great debate, but perhaps we can continue that a bit later. Um, my request really is to Henrik to say, fantastic film, really, really powerful, and is there any way that 
some of us, other organisations, can use it um, as an advocacy tool. Oh, sure. If we could get access to it. Well, we be can have a grateful. DVD or a, yep. a file However or you want to whatever you want. I mean, that's why I did it. So yeah, that would be great. The more you use it, the better. So that, that was my request, and that's just... Oh, can we... I suggest you go... Um, um, yes. Well, either you contact Babu or me directly, and we'll fix it somehow. So on that, yeah, uh, mm. that'd be great. On that note, actually, it would be really useful if perhaps we had the email contacts for everybody here, for the people that have attended. It's okay, then. Bye. Thank you. I don't see Bibi. I've not finished. Oh, you have not finished? Yes. Right. <laughs> I was just introducing what I wanted to say. Now, look at this man here. I'm sure you can see. I met this man in a ferry in India. He's making money. Yes. What is he selling? I bought, I bought this. <laughs> Juju. Yeah, that's what they call it here. Charms. They have so many names. Look at it. You can pass it around if you want. Now, you see, what I'm saying is that that's another aspect. Somebody comes up and has a charm, he goes around. He collects money from people and gives them chalk, charcoal, bones, you know, ants, dead ants and things like that. He packages it. So, exploitation. People are dying. People are paying money to buy germs. Now, this. Um, some of us must have watched, uh, was it BBC Channel 4? There was a documentary on uh, witchcraft in Nigeria. That was in November last year. Now, pastors are making money. They come around and they demonize children. They call them witches. They want to exercise them. They ask parents to pay money. And sometimes, you know, these are traditional superstitions. the traditional superstitions believe but they also have biblical support, um, just like uh, Levi was trying to say. You get it. So when they, when evangelists come there, they you know they try to sanctify, they try to support some traditional superstition. So they are complicating our work. So if we are really going to make a difference, particularly uh, in Africa, in my continent, Africa, if we are to make a difference, we must radically. Ra I use the word radical. Radical fighting, radical combating, radical tackling, radical challenging, radical debating, radical debunking of superstition. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.